All right, guys, thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, juniors, I know this is a, a lot of information explosion for you guys, but trust me, it's all worth it for you guys. Um, so without further ado, everyone, this is Bobby Holly from Mozilla. All right, uh, I'm gonna try to turn on this microphone and keep it out of that cone where it's gonna sound really bad. Uh, does this sound good to everybody? Is this enough projection? Yes. Yes. Um, everybody ready to talk? Yes. Cool. Okay, hi everybody. Um, my name is Bobby Holly. I'm better known as B Holly on the internet. Um, and I've been involved with Mozilla for about six and a half years now. Uh, and I know that that's kind of an eternity in the scale of the internet. So, you know, I'm hoping to explain a little bit why I've done that. Um, I know that you guys, you know, you just had this really big brain dump talk, um, lots and lots of information, and so I really appreciate uh, that you've stuck around, at least, you know, those of you who were here for the previous talk and those of you who came down. Um, it's really exciting for me to be here right now um, because, at least for me personally, I've always been a big believer in this idea that, you know, you don't need this you know, you don't need anything special. You don't need a fancy four-year institution or any sort of degree to become a world-class software engineer. Because software engineering is something that you learn by doing. Um, and that's really cool, because here, you know, you guys are sort of ground zero of where that idea is taking hold, right? You are right now cramming your heads full of knowledge, lots of technical facts, lots of, you know, strategies and algorithms and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and you are going to be the next generation of web developers, right? For some of you in a couple weeks, some of you in a couple months, you're going to be going out there um, and you're going to be leaving your mark. You are going to be defining the next web, the next web that we're all going to have. Uh, and that's really cool, right? It's an incredible amount of power that you all have to shape the world. Um, and it's also a big responsibility because you have the power to go out and make the web awesome, even more awesome than it's ever been. But you also have the power to do some things that might make the web less awesome. Um, and the direction that the web takes really matters. Um, it matters for a bunch of reasons, but if for no other reason, then this is your livelihood, right? You guys just paid this big hack reactor tuition to learn about the web. I really hope that it lasts for a while and it continues to be a good technology. Um, so I know that you guys are all here and really tired and busy cramming your head with facts. Um, but I'm hoping that we can just take like one hour to step back a little bit and ask some of the bigger questions, right? Like, like why are you learning the web? Why this platform over other platforms? Why is it great? Why, what makes it awesome? Um, and what are the things that we need to do to keep it awesome and keep it healthy? So that's kind of the general idea of this talk. Um, I'm not going to, you know, go too much into my own personal story, but I do know that everybody here is kind of excited about going out and entering the industry. Um, so I'm just going to give a couple brief anecdotes sort of on the introduction of how I got involved in that kind of stuff. So um, I will admit it, I grew up in the Bay Area uh, and I went to Stanford. Um, and I know that it's pretty easy to kind of write that off as like, oh yeah, like this is somebody who did it the old fashioned way, this isn't really, you know, relevant here. Um, but that's not really how it worked for me. Um, I would still say that most of my software engineering, most of my programming ability was self-taught. I did a lot of stuff, you know, in high school. I was poking around with Linux on the weekends, doing little toy programming projects. And I went to Stanford and, you know, I took some computer science classes. But for me, the really big thing was that I did an internship with NVIDIA my first summer after freshman year. And this was really cool because, you know, they didn't really like to take freshmen, right, you know? Um, but I kind of weaseled my way in there, like they, they wanted to see some coursework that I didn't necessarily have, but I convinced them to let me give it a, give it a try. Um, and that was amazing. I showed up, I started working, and it blew my mind just how much that I was learning by just working. Um, I was learning way more every day at NVIDIA than I had ever learned in a computer science class at Stanford. And then so I started running, you know, the numbers in my head and realized that, you know, I think that Programming is really something that you learn by doing, right? And there are various settings where you can learn by doing. And at Stanford, I was paying a bunch of money to learn by doing by taking computer science classes. And at NVIDIA, I was getting paid money to learn by doing. Um, and so that didn't really add up. Uh, so I changed my major. Um, I also could have dropped out, but I didn't. Uh, instead, I decided to go learn something totally different. I decided to learn electrical engineering. Um, so I went and I did a lot of like signal processing, optimization, crunching lots of integrals. And that was an undergraduate and a master's degree. 
And then on the side, I had this parallel career of computer science stuff, of programming, of doing open source projects, of volunteering, of doing internships. And when both of those came to a close, I got my master's degree in electrical engineering, and I realized that actually I had no interest to go into that industry. And the life of a software engineer was so much more exciting, so much more fun, so much more impactful, that I went and did that and haven't really looked back. Um, so I will say that you guys are probably, in my opinion, in the right industry, a really fun one to be in. Um, and so, yeah, next summer, I did an internship with Mozilla. Um, and, you know, this was yet another step of mind-blowing. It was really cool because there was a lot of excitement in the air. We shipped Firefox 3 my second day on the job. Um, so I can't really take any credit for that. Um, but, you know, it made it a fun environment to be in. And that was cool. But the thing that really excited me was realizing how Mozilla as an organization worked and what it was like to be a part of it. Because I had thought that NVIDIA was a really cool place to be, right? People were laid back, they wore casual clothes, they called each other by their first names, you know, everybody, everybody kind of got things done. But Mozilla was very different. At NVIDIA, the basic idea was the things that make our customers happy, make our customers money, and make us money, those are the things that we want to do. We want to focus on our business relationships and the stock price. At Mozilla, this was a mission-driven organization. It was a very different story. These were people who were not concerned about any stock price. These were people who were concerned about making the web better, about making it better for everybody and not just any particular partners of theirs. And so that engendered this kind of hacker rebel culture that I'd sort of always dreamed of when I was you know, reading Linux journal like late at night as a high school kid, um, but I'd never really seen in practice before. And on top of that, the organization of Mozilla was fully geo-distributed. And, you know, I had thought when I was at NVIDIA that I had seen geo-distribution. We had half of our team in Bangalore. We had these really inconvenient 8 p.m., 8 a.m. meetings. Um, but this was a very different story. Because at NVIDIA, the people who were in India, they were not making the decisions. All of the decision makers, all of the technical leads were in the office together in Santa Clara. But when Mozilla started out, there was nobody being paid to work on it. The project was kept afloat by an army of volunteers around the world. These were people in rural Georgia, or in Toronto, or in New Zealand, or in Europe, all over the world working nights and weekends. So they had funny schedules and they had funny time zones, and they had to learn to work together asynchronously. And so this created a culture where things were not done by conversations at the water cooler, they were done on email, public email lists, listservs, um, on Bugzilla, on stuff that needed to be synchronous was done on IRC chat that was always logged. If there ever needed to be a person-to-person -person conversation, that could always be done on a phone call so that people could call in. And this was because you couldn't really make a decision, a really important decision, just involving the people who were in the office because so many of the technical leads, so many of even the managers, were working from their homes all around the world. And so it forced the organization to be 100% accessible to people who were not in the office. And on top of that, it was accessible to people who were not only just not in the office, but not employees of any particular corporation. And this is what it means, or at least what I discovered what it meant, to be an open organization. There's this phrase um, that I think describes a lot of things in the Silicon Valley, which is that um, uh, secrecy is contagious, right? When you start having secrets inside your organization, you start having to make more and more things secret because these secrets spread, and you get a culture of secrecy. You know, you hear that on the Apple buses, people are not allowed to work on their work on the bus because somebody else in another division of Apple might see what's on their screen. But then when you flip that around and you start always asking the question, does this need to be private at all? Why can't everything be open? You start getting the reverse effect of openness being contagious. And this is a really cool effect to see, right? Like, do you need something, some help from ops or IT? Yeah, file a bug, and that bug is gonna be public by default unless you have any reason to make it private. If you want to call a meeting, you can call a meeting, but the notification that you send goes out to a fully public listserv 
And that generally includes lots of things like a dial-in number, an IRC back channel, and a wiki where people are going to take notes. And so when you sort of turn that whole thing around, it means that people who are not employed by the organization can fully take part. They can be full members and fully empowered. And they don't need any sort of you know, handler from the corporation or from the foundation that feeds them information and that does things on their behalf. And this culture of openness and volunteers is you know, within the organization of Mozilla, but it also spills out to the rest of the industry. Um, I think a good example is one of our core DOM contributors to the DOM implementation of Firefox is this anonymous kid in Belgium. He is known only as MS2GER, but he is prolific. He does tons of stuff, lots and lots of patches. And at some point, it became obvious that he was a good candidate to represent Mozilla to the W3C as the editor of the DOM specification. But the W3C had this rule that you, know, you had to put your name and contact information and register all that stuff if you were going to be an editor. But Mozilla pushed back on that and asked why. Why is this stuff necessary? And Mozilla won. So now if you go and look at the DOM specification, you will see editor, MS2GER, Mozilla Foundation. And that's all that's necessary because really you don't need to know what his address is. He's doing good work. So I think when a lot of people think of an organization being open, they tend to imagine it being very chaotic. Um, but this is, not also, this is also not the case with Mozilla. Mozilla is not an organization that is run by consensus. It is a very strong culture of meritocracy and in some cases of duocracy. And this is absolutely crucial because this is how corporations work. This is how for-profit corporations work and why they are so effective. And so if you want to compete with those for-profit corporations, you kind of have to raise your level of effectiveness as well. And so there was this billboard a little while back that I really liked. It's like mozilla.combrains.orgheart. And to me, that really gets to the core of one of the things that I think is really special and unique about Mozilla. Um, because I think in the public good nonprofit sector, there's this tendency of people to conflate their projects. Right? We're like, well, I want to do something for the public good. And if I'm doing that, then all the code should be open source. And if the code is open source, then we should make our decisions by consensus. And honestly, guys, if we're doing consensus, then we should all be vegetarian. And it kind of, you know, <laughs> bubbles out from there. And you end up with a lot of lack of clarity of what the focus is and what the goals are, and a lot of gridlock between people who aren't aligned on everything. And this is sadly why people often prefer working for for-profit corporations than public good foundations and NGOs, because corporations know how to get things done, and getting things done feels good. So I would very much encourage you, in whatever projects you go out and work on, to be very pragmatic about what you're doing. Be careful not to let the scope of whatever your ideals go so big that you fail to make progress on anything. And I think the only reason that Mozilla has been able to make such an impact on the web is that it has been very pragmatic about what it's done. At the same time, though, um, the competition of Mozilla is quite brutal. Um, you know, so people like to joke that if you had to pick your competitors, you probably would not pick Google, Apple, and Microsoft. Right? These are the three <laughs> most effective, most powerful tech giants probably in the world. And those are the three other competitors in the web browser space. So we can get somewhere by being effective, by being pragmatic, by making decisions quickly. But on the flip side, these are also companies that are 50 to 100 times the size of Mozilla as an organization, as like a, in terms of the number of employees. So there's got to be something else in there. And the way that Mozilla deals with this is by leveraging a much wider community and by leveraging these people's initiative and their common goal of making the web a better place. And Mozilla's current CEO, Chris Beard, likes to call this unlocking the rebel factor. Um, you know, you can't always, you know, beat the incredible Imperium just by force alone, but if you bring together enough people, you can do pretty cool things. And I think to illustrate this, you know, when I started as an intern at Mozilla, I was kind of poking around trying to fix bugs, and I found there was this module of code in the graphics engine for color management. 
And it was just something that nobody had the cycles to work on. And so I started patching it and adding fixes. And very clearly, very quickly, people started to recognize that I knew more about this than anybody else. And they started deferring to me and asking me what we should do about this. They gave me the ability to make these decisions. And that felt great because I was empowered. I knew that people cared about what I was doing and that I was in the position to decide how it was going to happen. And so then even when I left my internship, I stayed on as a volunteer because I was so passionate about it and it felt so good to be a part of this project. And I felt so validated by what I was doing. And this, on a scale of many, many more hundreds of people, is how Mozilla has won its battles in the past. Some of the biggest battles you know, that I'm going to talk about in a minute. And you know, if all goes well, that will be how Mozilla wins its battles in the future. So you know, that internship finished. I volunteered throughout the year, as I said. And I got this you know, kind of kooky idea that you know, because I was going to be studying abroad in Paris in the spring, that I would do this internship in the Paris office in the summer, because I knew that Mozilla had a Paris office. And I asked around about some people, and they said, yeah, that sounds fine. But when it got down to it, in the end, somebody finally asked the people in the Paris office, and it turns out that it was really small and kind of cramped, and there wasn't really space for an intern. Um, so the eventual solution was that uh, they gave me a contract, and they told me, go have fun. So initially, I thought that I would um, you know, go sit in a cafe somewhere, but then I got a bigger idea. <laughs> um, I bought myself a URL pass, and I hopped on a train and went all over Europe for the summer taking my laptop with me. And this was awesome, because I was totally by myself. There was no Mozilla colleagues around me. But because it was so geo-distributed, because I could work from anywhere, all of the tools were there, there were always people to talk to, I was not cut off at all. I was absolutely effective. I had a project which was making images decode asynchronously. I was making things happen on that, and it felt great. And it felt so great, in fact, that you know, this kind of became my life for the last five years. Um, and I'm not going to talk too much about that right now, but happy to talk about it after the talk. You, know, we can, you can come and ask me, or we can do it during Q&A. Um, but suffice it to say, I have really very much enjoyed the flexibility of working remotely for Mozilla. Um, so my, in terms of what I do now, you know, I, I code in Vim. I work mostly on C++, um, though I often hack on the JavaScript engine, which means that I sometimes manage to write a couple lines of JavaScript as well. Um, but for the most part, I'm a platform generalist, so I you know, started the graphics engine, doing color management, image decoding. Then I went over and started working on the DOM implementation, the JavaScript engine, and then when those two things meet, you have security architecture, and that's sort of something that I own as well. And more recently, I have been working on multimedia decoding, audio and video playback. Um, and I work from home. I live in the Bay Area. But uh, I go into the office only about once a week. And this is absolutely great for me, because I don't need to waste time on a commute, which is nice. But even more importantly is that it gives me the total flexibility to pick the times when I work. And this has been you know, one of my biggest takeaways from working in the industry is that working when you're effective and when you're inspired and when you're in the zone is so much more useful than working when you're not. In fact, it's sometimes very often counterproductive to work when you're not in the zone. So what I do is I'm around the house, I have my computer, and I have a little stopwatch. And I run the stopwatch when I'm in the zone and typing. And as soon as that's done, as soon as I find myself falling off, I stop the clock and wander off and I do something else. Um, and this comes out, in fact, to about 30 hours a week. And I know that that's very surprising because in the Silicon Valley, there's this culture of you work 60-hour you know, weeks, 70-hour weeks, 80-hour weeks. And I know that's not in everybody's control. But I think that that's a good thing to push back on when you can because no matter how much you torture yourself, no matter how much you work through the weekend, pound your head on the desk, you are going to be 10 times or 100 times better at your job if you are having fun in the moments when you're doing it. Because if you're having fun and you're focused and you're engaged, you're not going to make the bug that then you have to spend a whole week tracking down. And if you're debugging somebody else's thing, you're going to see that little connection of, aha, that allows you to short circuit the whole painful brute force debugging process and just get right to the answer. 
And so I'm not a slacker. Um, like, there were some statistics that came out, and in 2013, I was the second most prolific committer at Mozilla, right? So that is possible in 30 hours a week, as long as those 30 hours a week are actually focused, right? When people are in the office, you are often kind of, you know, you screw around, you sit there, you check slash dot, maybe you walk over and play ping pong. And it's totally possible to do this in the office as well, to work when you're focused. But I think it's just a little bit harder because there's often a pressure to look busy. Um, so that's just my two cents on the topic, but not really the focus on the talk. So anyway, as I said, I've been around Mozilla for a very long time. Um, and it's starting to get to the point where it's almost comical. Um, I was having discussion with somebody a couple weeks ago, and we sort of came up with this idea, and I was like, yeah, I think I actually found a bug about that at some point. And then I went and looked at the bug, and I'd filed this bug five and a half years ago. <laughs> and it still hadn't gotten done. Um, but that kind of makes me feel a little bit old. But actually, in the context of Mozilla, I would say that I joined very late in the game. Um, and this is because Mozilla's history is very wrapped up in the entire history of the web. So I think in order to really understand what Mozilla is and where it comes from, we have to rewind a little bit. Um, so that takes us to Mosaic. This was the first graphical web browser. Before Mosaic, the web was just a terminal program. There were various simple browsers. And the idea of the web was really not much um, more glorious than uh, cross-referenced documents, right? The idea was they wanted to have an ability to cross-reference information so that you didn't have to go pull out another book all the time. You could just click a link. Basically what Wikipedia is without any of the dynamic editing capabilities. Um, and there was a university project at um, whatever UI, Illinois maybe, .edu, uh, where they made the first graphical web browser. And it doesn't look like much, but at the time it was kind of revolutionary because this was the first foray into this idea that the web could be an experience, right? That it was not just something that you do on the library computer, but that it was actually like something that takes up your whole screen that you interact with a little bit more. Um, so one of the people, Mark Anders Andreessen, who worked on the university project, decided that he wanted to go to the Silicon Valley and start the first commercial web browser. So he made this company that was the Mosaic Communication Corporation or something like that. Um, and then they got into a bit of a legal battle with the university over the use of the name Mosaic. Um, so there are varying stories but um, you know, there was talk of, well, how the name Mozilla came to be, but one of them is that they wanted to make the mosaic killer, right? And then that was gonna become the Mozilla Mozilla. Uh, Mozilla was actually the code name of the first Netscape product. And then obviously the marketing people came along and was like, oh, that's not, that's not actually a great name. Um, <laughs> and so they renamed it Netscape Navigator and then later Netscape Communicator. But the name Mozilla lived on in the source code. So this was fun for a little while. But then Microsoft noticed that there was this awesome thing called the web and they weren't really involved in it and they wanted to be involved. So we got to what is known as the sort of first generation of the browser wars. Netscape had the lead, they had a product first. But Microsoft had a lot of resources to get into the game. And so it turned into this very heated competition between Netscape and Internet Explorer. And this competition yielded some pretty cool stuff, right? There's the famous story that um, some boss of Brendan Eich, when he was working in Netscape, was like, hey, we need a scripting language, uh, call it JavaScript, just can you do it in 10 days, right? It's not totally clear whether it was 10 days, but it was obviously not as much time as he should have spent on it. <laughs> um, and that was cool, and then Microsoft copied it, but they couldn't get the trademark on JavaScript, so they called it JScript. Um, and that was fun, but the problem, which is kind of almost illustrated by the JavaScript thing, was that there was a very low barrier to shipping features. You could kind of just do it. You either needed an engineer who was excited about it, or a product guy who would tell the engineer to do it. And this meant that it was too easy to 
put features into the web, and that gave us some less cool things. Some of them were pretty innocuous, um, like, uh, I don't know if you guys know the marquee tag, which causes the text to walk around the screen. Uh, and then you've got the blink tag, which makes the text blink, and when you combine them, you get the blinky of the thing going all around. There's lots of dumb stuff. There's modal dialogues. Um, they're a pain in the butt, but they don't get too much in our way now. But then there was also some more difficult stuff. And this was when the competition kind of turned nasty, and it turned negative. And I think the reason that the competition, I would say, turned negative is that the browsers were no longer competing about being better for the user. They were competing to lock in content, right? To make content exclusive for their web browser. And in that situation, the user doesn't win because the user doesn't have a choice. The user visits a website, and the website tells them that their current browser doesn't work, and so they can either not visit the website, or they can go download the other browser. And then you start having other pieces, like operating system and architecture lock-ins. Microsoft was pushing this technology called ActiveX. I don't know if anybody remembers, but it was basically glorified Windows programs running inside Internet Explorer. Obviously not cross-browser, obviously not cross-platform. Um, and you couldn't necessarily uninstall Internet Explorer either. And so what Microsoft started doing was they started making partnership deals with the OEMs, the people who manufactured desktop computers, with Compaq and HP and Dell, and told them that if you guys want to ship Microsoft Windows on your PCs, you cannot ship Netscape. And obviously they had to ship Internet Explorer because Internet Explorer was built into the operating system. You couldn't even rip it out no matter how hard you tried. So even though Netscape originally had the lead in the browser wars, this very quickly sealed the deal. In a matter of a year or two, the numbers just went like this. And so Netscape was pretty doomed. But rather than totally fading into irrelevancy, they, in their irrelevance, uh, in their death, they did two historically very important things. The first one was that they took Microsoft to court and all the way to Congress. And they sued them for being a monopolist. So here you have uh, Bill Gates passionately defending why Microsoft was doing the right thing. And I think you've got, uh, I think that's Andreessen, the CEO of Netscape, and then that's um, Scott McNeely of Sun Microsystems or something like that. I don't totally know all my old white men. Um, <laughs> but, you know, we all know how the industry works, and even if you win a legal battle, that doesn't mean you're suddenly relevant again. And that's true, it didn't save Netscape. But what it did was it branded Microsoft legally as a convicted monopolist. And this hamstrung them for the next 10, 15, 20 years. And it gave them legal hurdles that prevented them from using their incredible might to crush the web once again. So I think the reason we have seen, or at least one of the reasons why Microsoft has been slow, so flat-footed in the web up until very recently is because they had a lot of legal challenges that made it difficult for them to be up to their old tricks. The other piece is that they created the Mozilla Foundation. So this was kind of a parting, screw you, um, we're going under, but we are going to open source our code. Um, and maybe somebody else, originally it was kind of a strategy that they would crowdsource their development. That didn't totally work. But they created a foundation called the Mozilla Foundation to shepherd what had become the open source Netscape code. And so this is actually the truth that the Mozilla code is directly inherited from the Netscape code. And this started with a very small organization called the Mozilla Foundation. And there were not very many people involved in this. And it was a small ragtag group. And these were people who had lost a war, right? These were people who were bitter. These were people who felt that the web was going in the wrong direction. And just to be clear, I don't think that the web would have necessarily been very much better if somehow Netscape had won the browser wars instead of Internet Explorer. But that actually doesn't really matter, because what mattered was that the people now who were running Mozilla had a very keen sense of what it felt like to have the web sucked up into some proprietary silo, such that they no longer really controlled their relationship with the internet. And that really stung. 
they knew what it felt like to lose control of this kind of stuff. And so in a way, they were very much radicalized. And like all radicalized people in the Bay Area, they came up with 10 principles. <laughs> Um, so I'm not going to go through them all, you know, everybody has their favorites. Um, but the Mozilla Foundation was formed around what they called the manifesto, a lot of pretty bombastic rhetoric. Um, but the principles, I'm going to go through a couple of them. One of them is that the internet is a global public resource that should be open and accessible. Individuals' security and privacy on the internet are fundamental and cannot be treated as optional. Individuals must have the ability to shape the internet and their own experience on the internet. And the effectiveness of the internet depends upon interoperability, innovation, and decentralized participation worldwide. And so, I kind of feel, or at least I kind of hope, that these things are sort of obvious to most of the people in this room, or at least a lot of people kind of are on board with this thing. At the time, that was not the case. And I think the fact that we have gotten this far with the web speaks tremendously to how effective this mission has been and how much progress Mozilla has been able to make, as well as the people who also believe in the open web. Um, and so, you know, Mozilla is an organization with all of its, you know, pseudo-communist swag um, <laughs> went off along its business. It was a very small organization. Um, they were not necessarily very focused or aligned at the beginning. Um, at the very beginning, there was this idea that it was unethical to ship um, anything but the source code, right? Because you wanted every user to know how to compile it themselves. <laughs> that one didn't really, didn't really hold. Um, but things started moving. And at the time, this mission of competing with Microsoft and competing with Internet Explorer was basically unthinkable, right? This was even smaller than Netscape, which had lost. And Microsoft was a huge tech giant. But the really interesting thing is that Microsoft kind of slept. They weren't really interested in pushing the web forward because the web had just caused them a lot of trouble. And the web wasn't really aligned with what they liked to do because when stuff is in the web, then you can use it on any operating system. Whereas when something is a Windows program, then you can only use it on Microsoft Windows. So that's obviously the better platform. So they did a couple little pieces of Microsoft SharePoint integration and that kind of stuff. But by and large, they said, yeah, the web is done. It is not aligned with our goals. So we're going to put the browser into maintenance mode. And because Internet Explorer rules the world, that's how it's going to be. Um, and so the web, the web stagnated. There were various polyfill technologies. There was you know, ActiveX. There was Java. There was Flash. These things were better than Internet Explorer but I think they were pretty obviously still not very great. Meanwhile, over in Mozilla land, there were also some very interesting and uh, important technical decisions that were being made. And one of the biggest ones was this idea that, you know, because this is this open source project that everybody's supposed to be contributing to, it was very difficult for people to conceptualize how open source volunteers would hack on the front end because there were three separate C++ back end, you know, code bases for Mac, Windows, and Linux. And so what they did was they rewrote the whole system such that the front end was coded in JavaScript and CSS and this kind of you know, HTML-y thing called Zool. Um, and that seemed pretty crazy at the time to use the same engine that's rendering your web page to also render your preferences dialog and your back button. But it actually worked, and it meant that suddenly any web developer could come along and hack on the front end. And this meant that when an intern named Blake Ross came and did an internship at Mozilla and realized that he was really sick of this really big, complicated user interface, in the course of his summer internship, he was kind of able just to redo it, right? Because it was all just a bunch of JS and CSS. He just you know, had a couple sprints and made something new. And that new thing was first called Phoenix, and then it was called Firebird. And then finally, it was called something that stuck, which was Firefox. And so, you know, some people disagree on exactly how much Blake Ross did, whether he was the guy that deserved to be on the cover of Wired, but, you know, that's how the history is. Um, and 
the more important thing about this picture is that I think it harkens back to this day when the web was suddenly fun again. It was a renaissance, and it didn't have to suck, right? We now had this browser that didn't show you pop-up windows, and that gave you tabbed browsing. And lots of new things started to happen. And they grew features on the client, and they also grew web features. But because everybody was so sick of what had happened with Internet Explorer, these web features were not developed and shipped in the same way as the marquee tag and the blink tag. These things were done in collaboration, in standard bodies, with the other small browsers, which was Safari and Opera at the time. And then we got propaganda like this. Please don't hurt the web, use open standards. That was, yeah, I really liked that at the time. Still do. Um, but I think it's important to think about what exactly this means. Like, what is an open standard? Because technically an open standard is just a published specification that you are allowed to implement to create a technology. But there are lots of standards that are open standards, right? Like Flash is an open standard, and Microsoft Word is an open standard, or at least the, the .doc or .docx format. Um, but it turns out that an open standard actually really only means something when there are multiple interoperable first-class implementations of that standard, right? And this kind of thing is sort of the industry equivalent of uh, unit testing and code review. It's one of these things that's like working with standards bodies is like really annoying when you just want to get something done and ship it. Um, and it's also the same thing that is going to make all the difference in the long run when you forget about this thing now, but it starts conflicting with other things down the line and you find yourself with a rat's nest of your own making. So having multiple implementations means that the spec actually has to mean something. It can't be hand wavy on any of the points. And it means that when there's a bug in one of the implementations, that bug doesn't just become the spec the way it does with Flash or the way it did with Internet Explorer, because other browsers implement the spec correctly. And then people are like, oh, this is just a bug. And it means that the best API is the thing that's designed and not just the thing that happened to be the most convenient to implement for whoever was in charge at that time. Like most of the nasty, quirky stuff in the web APIs that you guys deal with, like stuff with like window and location, that is all just holdovers from the bad design decisions that were made in the 90s. And even though web browsers have progressed in their architecture such that that bad stuff isn't necessary, we all have to bend over backwards just to imitate it because it wasn't designed right from the start. And on a more general level, this kind of thing, having standards bodies and having you know, multiple browsers, avoids the kind of deadline and marketing-driven engineering that gets things done fast, but not necessarily well. And I know that sometimes it is better to get things done fast than well, right? Like Specifically, sometimes you just need to ship a website and you go do it. But if you make a crappy website, everybody can just you know, ignore it and go use a different website or wait until you fix it. But if people make a crappy web browser, you as web developers have zero choice as to how you reach your users. You have to reach them through their web browser. And so the decisions that may go into the web platform have exponentially more impact and are exponentially more powerful than the ones that go into any particular um, application. And so, you know, this is, just like I said before, incredible power and incredible responsibility. Um, and when that power is too focused in any one camp, it tends to corrupt. Um, like Mozilla's old CEO, John Lilly, used to say, like, I don't want 90, 80% market share for Firefox, right? I want like 30, 35%. I want enough market share to influence the web, but not enough to crowd it out and stifle it. And when Internet Explorer 6 was kind of dwindling and it was the rise of Firefox and Safari and Opera, this was finally happening. And then it started to happen even faster. So I don't know how much you guys remember about this, but when Google came out with a browser called Chrome, they launched it with a graphic novel done by this artist, cartoonist Scott McCloud, who's you know, one of the big people in that space. 
and it was really well done. So this was the first page. He was kind of saying, wouldn't it be great just to like start from scratch, not use those old web browsers, and do something based on the needs of you know, websites and users today? This sounded really great. It's, it's also a little bit of a jab at the pre-existing web browsers by saying that Chrome is newer. Um, and it also, it's not totally true because um, you know, Chrome borrowed Apple's engine, which was called WebKit. And they shared WebKit for a whole number, for you know, a number of years. Um, but it doesn't really matter because they brought a lot of really great stuff. They brought this process per tab model that really increased responsiveness. And it was great because they were bringing more competition to the space. They had lots of great ideas. They had great JavaScript performance at the time. And there was a lot of excitement in the web browser implementation community when Chrome came out because it was like, yeah, like now we finally got some big firepower. Like let's band together and all get the web off of Internet Explorer 6. That was the mission. <laughs> <laughs> and that happened. But it also started to get pretty hot. Um, <laughs> this is like one of my favorite drawings ever. Because you see Internet Explorer somewhere there in the background with broken glass <laughs> over it. <laughs> but this is what's happening. Um, Google started spending a lot of money on it. Um, and they, you know, just like, you know, just like the NSA, like they took their job very seriously. Uh, and they wanted to, <laughs> sorry, that's too much. <laughs> but um, they were pumping money into this space on a scale that nobody had ever seen before. Um, it was, you know, in just in terms of marketing, it was in the billions of dollars. And this was very new. Um, and they were marketing, you know, not just to Internet Explorer users, but kind of to everybody, right? Like, even when you would go in Safari or in Firefox to do a Google search, it would tell, hey, you know, try a faster browsing experience, try downloading Google Chrome. But they were also, to, be, you know, to their credit, pouring billions of dollars into engineering. Um, and they were creating a great product. And on top of that, this product was more or less open source. And this was another subject of the cartoon. So Scott went and he interviewed various engineers and kind of did renditions of what they were and what they had to say. And so one of these guys was saying, sure, we could build a proprietary browser, but Google lives on the internet. It's in our interest to make the internet better. And without competition, we have stagnation. And so that's why we're open sourcing the whole thing, because we need the internet to be a fair and smart and safe place. Like, wow, that sounds great. It sounded great to me at the time, still sounds great. This guy absolutely believes it. And I'm serious that I have the highest respect for the engineers that work on the Chromium project, right? We interact all the time. We very much care about the same things. Everybody wants the web to be awesome. And it's really to Google's credit that they have created this organization where people like this guy can do the work that they love and can you know, feel good about doing it. But at the same time, Google is not solely comprised of people like this guy, right? Google is a for-profit corporation, and as a for-profit corporation, they have a legal obligation to hire other kind of people, like business people. And business people tend to see things somewhat differently. Because what the business people understand is that you don't actually need to have a closed source project in order to control it, right? Microsoft went a little too far and they kind of pissed some people off while they were doing it. What the business people realize is that actually all you need is a brand and an update channel. You can absolutely open source it, and who cares? Because if you go and you build a fork of the Chromium open source project because you don't like the direction that it's going, then how do you influence the web? You influence the web by doing something different. You implement a new feature, you don't implement some feature. And when Google decides to implement a feature, they are deciding on behalf of half of a billion people, right? Because they have all these people who have downloaded Chrome, who use Chrome, and who they have an update channel to. So they can literally just push changes, and those things are live on half a billion computers. 
if you make your own fork of the open source project, the number of people you decide for is precisely the number of people that you can convince to go and download your browser and use it. And convincing people to go and download your browser and use it is this thing that we call browser marketing. And that's something that Google is spending billions of dollars on and that you probably aren't. And when Google is making this decision of what people use, they're not actually deciding with the Chromium open source project. They're deciding with a project, with a product that is called Google Chrome. And Google Chrome is not open source. It's a much smaller business unit that's tacked on at the very end. And that's where they kind of do some of their less nice things. Um, the Chromium open source project has a web standards review committee that is designed to prevent things that are bad from the web from being shipped in the product. So when the product and marketing people at Google want to put something like that in, they don't go to Chromium. They go one step further in the pipeline and put it in on the Chrome product team. And basically, you know, kind of circumvent that open source guy. So at a very high level, you know, that NSA comment aside, it was just a joke. Um, I'm not saying that Google is an inherently evil company. Um, I think that Google has done a very good job, considering their size and power, of doing stuff that is really awesome for the world. And generally, you know, being compared to Microsoft and how Microsoft used to act, being a relatively good citizen. But I think that it is naive, no matter who it is, to trust a for-profit C corporation as the sole arbiter of your own future because they're not necessarily going to do the right thing, whatever the right thing is, when it conflicts too much with their own interests. And the whole concept of the right thing is pretty vague anyhow. Um, you know, that brings us back to this idea of market share, right? You know, how much market share is the right amount of market share to have for your browser? If you ask the open source guy or if you ask John Lilly, they'll say, yeah, 30, 35%, right? We wanna have an influence on the web, but we wanna make sure that we don't stifle out the competition. Um, but if you ask a marketing person how much is a good amount of market share, they'll just be like, more, right? That's, that's what they want. That's their job. And the reason that's their job is that it gives them and it gives their business strategizing an immense amount of flexibility because they have vertical integration. And it means that they can start doing stuff like this, right? Where they don't really have to worry about making stuff work in every browser because, you know, at least for the initial launch of a product, honestly, the Chrome audience is probably the right size anyway. It's people, you know, maybe more people in the Bay Area, you know, people more likely to, you know, go try out a beta product like this. Um, and they do, you know, they've done things like this for a while, but then it also starts to become a pattern, right? And I think it's funny that, you know, WhatsApp is now owned by Facebook, which is kind of, you know, at odds with Google, but even they are doing things like this. And when you start having too much of this stuff, then you get to the point where every savvy user is just going and downloading Chrome because they are so sick of these roadblocks. And when all of those users and all of those developers end up congregating under the same tent, the web basically dies. And you end up with this. And I know this is not really great, um, but it's honestly not the thing that concerns me the most. And that is why, kind of circling back to the reason why I'm here giving this talk. Because I came here some number of months ago to watch my friend Jan give a talk, and I ended up kind of getting distracted and I didn't really spend very much time listening to him because I was just looking around at all of the screens and I realized that everybody's screen had a web browser open, which is kind of cool because it means that the web is really the thing. But every single web browser that I saw in this room was Google Chrome. And that wouldn't bother me so much if this was a public library or a graphic design studio or Stanford or whatever, right? But this is Hack Reactor, right? This is the place that is just, you know, rapidly educating people who are going to be going out and creating the next version of the web, right? You are the people who are going to be building it and what you do has an enormous impact on everybody. And as it turns out, just doing what people like to call cross-browser testing is not actually enough. Because web browsers are so complex 
that there are endless subtle differences, little quirks, little bugs, little things that are fast in one browser and not fast in another that you kind of discover as you're developing an application. And so no matter how committed to standards you are, even if you avoid this kind of egregious shit, your website is going to work the best in whatever browser you use to build it. So if you use a different browser each day while you're building it, or if you work in a team where everybody uses a different browser, then that's great. But if you develop in a monoculture, then the web just kind of starts to suck, right? Because with stuff like this, you know, when this came out or when the Facebook thing came out, there's, the blogosphere goes wild, right? Everybody shames these companies. Look at these stupid companies doing stupid stuff. Come on, guys, get behind open standards. And usually they fix what they're doing. But the other problem of just kind of not being on the happy path leads to this situation where you're like, yeah, you know, I was, I was trying to use Safari for a while, but, you know, Gmail, it was just kind of like, it was kind of weird for me sometimes. I, I don't know. Um, yeah, yeah, I don't know. I just switched back to Chrome. And this has happened for a long time on Google properties. You know, I will admit that I will often, when I'm using Google properties, I will open up Chrome to use Gmail and Google Spreadsheets and Google Drive because the experience is just slightly better. But the scary thing now is that this is spreading, right? Because even, and even when you avoid doing this absolutely nasty proprietary lock-in stuff, if you just develop on one browser, you are going to inadvertently depend on bugs in that browser. So, for example, I used to use this to-do list app called Wunderlist, which was made by this, you know, very cool, hip, a uh, German company called Zex Wunderkinder, right? And these people, you know, they're German, right? They're really into open standards. Um, but what I noticed was that when I was using the thing in Firefox, you know, like after some number of hours or some number of days, it would just get really laggy and the CPU would spike and it would be 100% until I closed the tab. And I personally had the luxury of being able to like, whoa, what's going on here? And I investigated and I talked to some colleagues. And what we determined was that this website was relying on a very specific bug in Google Chrome about this event called can play through, right? Google just fires it totally at the wrong time. It's kind of like an unimplemented feature for them. Um, and this website was expecting that that event was going to be fired in situations where it shouldn't. And when that didn't happen, it would end up just churning the CPU until you closed it. And this is the kind of thing that's really hard to find, right? Because if you just develop your website in one browser and then you fire up another browser and give it a shot, you know, it seems like it's fine, but you just kind of inadvertently create a sucky experience for everybody who isn't using the same browser that everybody on their development team appears to have been using, right? And now we get back to that issue of user choice, where users are presented with the choice of stop using the website, deal with the suckiness, or go download the same browser that these web developers and all the web developers in the world seem to be using, right? And this is not a great set of choices, but there aren't really any others. So, you know, I don't want to be too harsh here, but I think it's, you know, my opinion at least, that if you develop in a browser monoculture, you are going to be presiding over the death of your own industry. Like, you are going to help transform the web from this awesome, generative, interoperable thing into a vertically, enter, a vertically integrated silo. You're going to start your career right now or in a couple months as a web developer, and you are going to end it as a Google Chrome developer, or maybe later on something else. You are going to be a surf in one company's proprietary ecosystem, right? And it's not so bad, right? Like, lots of people get by being SAP and Oracle developers, but that's not really the excitement that I think everybody has in their mind right now. So in terms of what you should do, my biggest ask for everybody is just to use a different browser or to make sure that you have diversity while you're developing, right? And so what the browsers there are out there, there's a bunch of Blink-based browsers. There's a bunch of other browsers that actually embed the same engine as Google, right? Opera ditched its own engine, now Opera's Opera just is kind of a front end on top of Chromium. Same thing for this new thing called Vivaldi, founded by the XR Opera CEO. Those don't really get you anywhere on the web. 
Safari is definitely a step. It happens to share a lot of code and history with uh, the Blink project, but it's still something different. Um, and that leaves Internet Explorer and Firefox. And honestly, Internet Explorer is a great browser these days, and Firefox is too, right? Like, you know, it's, there was some thing in, Max, in PC Magazine, you know, they crowned it the, the best browser of, you know, 2014 or something. Um, and I don't want to get too much into this stuff, because I'm not saying that it is the best, or that it's always going to be the best, or that you should always recognize that Firefox is the best browser, right? That's not my kind of shtick. You know, in some ways it's measurably better, like in terms of right now, JavaScript performance and memory usage, but Chrome is a lot better right now on responsiveness, and Internet Explorer, at least on Windows, is currently leading on graphics, right? All of these organizations are also rapidly working to close all of those gaps with each other because they recognize that competitive advantage. But the bigger takeaway here is that the browsers are actually close enough in terms of performance and features that you can afford to be a little bit political about your decision. And it is true, and something that I do believe is important, is that Mozilla is the only nonprofit in this space, right? It is the only organization that is guaranteed to have your interests in mind or the interests of the web, whereas the other organizations, even if they do, it's only because right now those things are aligned with their goals. And that might change in the future. But the thing that I don't want to happen after this talk is for everybody on every development team in Hack Reactor to start using Firefox, right? Because that is the same kind of monoculture that creates a problem. So what I would like is for everybody to try using different browsers, right? Maybe use a different one every week, or if that's too much, when you're developing in a team, just make sure one of you is using one browser and one of you is using something else. I know that, you know, I've heard that there's um, a lot of instruction on Chrome's developer tools here. Um, Firefox has a whole browser that's just for developers. It's the pre-release channel. Um, used to be called Firefox Aurora, now it's Firefox Developer Edition. There's lots of developer tools. They work great. They work just like you'd expect. And I would challenge you to, you know, find anything that you can't do or something that doesn't work. I would be very interested. So, the baseline ask of everybody from me is to make sure that you do not develop in a browser monoculture because that is the thing that's going to kill the web. If you want to go further and you believe in Mozilla's mission enough that you want to help out Mozilla, the next thing that you can do is to start using you know, Firefox Developer Edition and just filing bugs, right? Because it's a pre-release channel, it's really helpful for us to have web developers who are using that and telling us when stuff doesn't work. And then on top of that, if you want to go even further, there is basically no limit to the extent to which you can get involved with Mozilla if that's something that interests you. And this is really fun. It's great for your career. It's a great thing to put on your resume. It's somewhere where you can learn a lot. And I know that there are lots of open source projects out there, but Mozilla happens to be a nice balance of something that's large enough to really support its volunteers and is also fundamentally from a mission perspective very dedicated to bringing in and mentoring as many, as many volunteers and kind of you know, future citizens of the web as possible. Um, so there's lots of resources for this. There's even this really cool website, um, whatcanidoformozilla.org, um, if this is something that interests you. Uh, here we go. So you can just go through this thing and you can say, oh yeah, like what do I want to do? I like all these things, but you know, here, Hack Reactor, I like writing code. What language do you want? Mm, like maybe I'll do JavaScript. So do that and then, yeah, like I think I want to work on lots of things. Um, maybe, you know, Loop. Loop is the, you know, the kind of, it's the video chat built into the browser based on WebRTC. Um, because remember, all of the front end is written in JavaScript. And you go here, um, and you have all of their meetings, you've got all the dial-in numbers, you've got all of the architecture documents, and all the ways that you can just get involved and start hacking. But even if you don't want to do you know, technical stuff, there's also you know, lots of other things that you can do. 